give me, you know, the, the most popular examples of being stuck that my listeners now could relate to? Yeah, I've been running this survey for about five years on people all around the world, asking them with that definition of stuckness, are you stuck in some way? And I find that people usually within about 15 seconds start typing a response, which means that stuckness is very top of mind and their responses vary. So some of them are financially stuck. They wanna be able to save or they wanna be able to earn more money. Some of them are stuck in relationships. Some are stuck in jobs. A lot of them are stuck quite narrowly in creative pursuits. Like I'm trying to learn this piano piece. I'm trying to learn this new art technique. I'm a filmmaker and I can't come up with creative ideas. Uh, I'm a business person and I can't figure out what my next venture should be. So there's a, there's a very broad range. Um, and I find that almost everyone in at least one respect with a bit of time comes up with something. They say, I'm stuck in this way and then they can express it. Is there a, a trend in who's getting stuck more often? Yeah, so I have a pet theory. I think um, the kind of career model for, for how we live our lives professionally is broken for most people. I think what happens is as you specialize, you're supposed to get more and more narrow in what you do and you have less variety in what you do. And that's how you get stuck is by doing the same thing every day. And there's a huge amount of evidence for that in all sorts of different areas. Actuarial science, for me at least, very quickly put me into that little pigeonholed spot where I felt I was getting trapped and it was only going to increase. And so the, the thing I've done ever since is to try to create as much variety in my professional life as possible. Because then if you don't like aspect number one, but you have nine other aspects to your job, you can go and do that for a, for a little while. And so bouncing around, I think, is critical for getting unstuck. Often very smart people get very, very interested in very narrow topics. And that's, that's essentially the definition of a PhD, is you spend a huge amount of time becoming an expert in a very narrow area. And I think that's fine for a PhD itself, but if you're gonna make a whole life out of doing that, I think if you're an, a restless, intellectually curious person, you're gonna get stuck really fast. You almost become a victim to being good at something in life, don't you? Because you get promoted and promoted and promoted up in that direction and your label, whatever it is, doctor, dentist, lawyer, becomes reinforced by your own success at that thing. And you can get 10 years down the line at something and go, how the fuck am I living next to the office? Yeah. I'm a lawyer, it's doing law 14 hours a day. What happened to that violin I used to play? And we become, you're right, we become really narrow individuals. And when you think about what a human is, we're so multifaceted, especially when we're younger. Yeah, We're doing all of these things. It's a real shame. I also think what happens is you get promoted and it does get narrow, but it also changes. So the thing that you were really good at is no longer the thing that you're doing. And a lot of what happens in promotion, especially professionally, is you become a manager and you manage people who do the thing you love instead of doing the thing you love. And so that's how you get stuck as well, is by, by being promoted out of the thing that got you passionate about what you were doing and being told, no, instead you're gonna watch other people do the thing you love. Now you suddenly have to be a people manager, which some people like doing, but a lot don't. And so that's also inherent in the kind of professional models that we have in hierarchical organizations. This happens by, I guess in part, by being a bit unconscious about what you want. Yeah. And you just kind of take what you're given. So you take the promotion and you take this and you take the, the relocation to this place. And how do we prevent that happening? I, I think that's the job of people who write about these subjects, right? And that, that's kind of what I saw as, as the mission for this book was to try to say, you know, if you don't want to be stuck or if you want to be able to get unstuck quickly, there's a set of questions you can ask yourself and let me just lay them out for you. Here they are. In fact, the, the last thing in the book is a hundred ways to get unstuck. It's just a digestion of all these ideas. And I think those are questions that people don't often ask themselves. You're right. There's a, a sort of accidental way that we live our lives and we take what's given. And if someone says, here's a promotion, you hear that word and you grab onto it and you, you write it as far as you can. But, um, I think it's it's easy to be a little bit mindless about where your life takes you. And and sometimes that's fine, but in a lot of cases it's not. And the book tries, in, in the book I try to distinguish those cases from, from uh, each other. Like when should you let life lead you and when should you be a little more purposeful? On, on that exact point, I've, I've mulled over the last couple of weeks this idea that there's kind of two narratives that prevail in our lives, kind of two instructors. One of them is the, this external narrative. It could come from your parents or society's expectation of you taking that promotion or thinking that that job is a admirable job for you to take so you take it that's the external narrative then the other narrative if i can call it that is how you feel yeah and i think we're 
we're conditioned to care more about that external narrative because the rewards seem to be more aligned with the external narrative than like how you feel. Because if people really were orientated by how they felt in that job, in that relationship, in that city, whatever, in that course at university, um, they would make significantly different decisions. But we, we always, we, it's almost like we've tuned out of that. Yeah. I, I think the problem is that humans don't know how they feel in isolation as well. If I took you and put you in a room for a week and said, you can have food and water and you can have your thoughts. And I took you out of, after a week and said, so what are you thinking? Like what's real, what's not real? What do you believe? What are your preferences and values? You'd struggle. It's re there's a lot of really interesting evidence that if you isolate humans, they don't really know what to do with themselves. So the, those external forces, that there's a kind of permeability between what I'm feeling inside my head and thinking and what these other forces are, sh are suggesting to me. So I, I, think, I think it's totally true that we don't pay enough attention to what will be good for us separate from what other people think we should be doing. But I also don't even think many of us know the answers to those questions, not all the time, but about a lot of things. Like I know deep somewhere, I know that I love to draw, that I'm, in, I'm at peace when I'm drawing and painting. I haven't done that for a really long time. I'm too busy to your point of being too focused, but I know that that's something that preference wise I love doing. But the, then the question, should I make my career and my life about that? The only way I knew how to answer that was by speaking to lots of people who said, it's very difficult to become an artist. Here's the path. It's probably gonna be hard to make any money. So keep it as a hobby. But, but knowing just based on my feelings what to do, I wouldn't have known what to do as a young person. And so I think that's, that's part of the problem is that it's not just that we're silly for kind of paying attention to others. It's also that I don't even know if we know in isolation without those inputs, what the right kinds of paths are. You said about putting me in a room and leaving me with my thoughts. That sounded like hell. It does, yeah. <laughs> and there's, you, I remember reading about the studies where people would rather take an electric shock than to sit idly on their own. Yeah. And they tested people and they said, would you rather take an electric shock or sit here for a couple of minutes on your own? And people took the... <laughs> It's a, it's a brilliant study. I mean, the way they set it up is brilliant because they get you to sit in this room and they do it with men and women, they're mostly college undergrads. And they say to them, you're just going to be sitting here for half an hour. There's a little machine in the corner. It delivers electric shocks. They've tried it already, so they know it hurts. It doesn't feel good. And they're told, you know, you can sit with your thoughts or, you know, the machine's there if you want to go and use it, which is a bizarre thing to say to people. And they sit there for a while and time passes and... Uh, the vast majority of them go, I think it's two thirds of them go and start playing with this machine. It's, it's so aversive to just sit with our own thoughts for even half an hour that we need stimulation, even if it's negative stimulation. So how do I know if I'm stuck? What, is there an emotional sort of, you know, sensation? Yeah, it's an interesting question. So it's, it's subjective. You, you know if you're stuck, you can feel it because you could be in the same situation and not feel stuck. I'll give you a good example of this. I, I had a conversation with Malcolm Gladwell, who was telling me about his dad, who was a math professor. And his dad was trying to solve a math conundrum for 30 years. By external definitions, he was stuck for 30 years because he couldn't solve this math puzzle, which is a common experience for, for math professors, I imagine. But he loved it. He didn't think of himself as being stuck. That for him was the process. That was why he went to work and why he kept doing what he was doing. And so, you know, I, if I thought about being stuck in something and not making meaningful progress objectively for 30 years, the idea drives me crazy. But for his dad, for Malcolm's dad, that, that was something that was really appealing. He, he really enjoyed that process. And so I think a lot of, of dealing with being stuck at first is getting your head around what it means to be stuck and figuring out that usually it's not as big a deal as it seems it might be. And once you come to grips with the emotional part of it, you can usually bring some sort of strategies and actions to bear and, and to start to move yourself. I'm convinced of that. And that's, that's why I write the book, because I think there is a way to get unstuck in almost every case. What is the, in your view, the relationship between perseverance, becoming unstuck or knowing when to quit? Yeah. I mean, there's, a, there's an amazing cottage industry on both sides of that spectrum of books that are being written that I think are excellent books that make the case for, for both of those ends of the spectrum. You've got Angela Duckworth's Grit, which is all about sticking through and, and continuing on. And I think Anatomy of a Breakthrough leans in that direction. And then you've got Annie Duke who wrote the book Quit, which is about quitting. The fact that we've got so many options all the time, most of us, why would you keep doing the thing you're doing if it's not working out for you? You should probably do something else. Now, they're both very sophisticated thinkers. They wouldn't say you should always persevere or always quit. 
but it's a great question. How do you know when you are stuck that it's time to persevere versus time to quit? And I, I think it's worth thinking about, A, the opportunity cost. So what are you leaving behind? Is there something else that's very obvious that would be an easy thing to jump to that would require leaving behind the thing that's making you stuck? And if that idea seems really appealing, as it did for me when I was doing actuarial science and wanted to jump away from that, then you should probably consider moving on. But the, re the research basically shows that almost always it's a good idea to persevere beyond the point where you say this is hard and it's not feeling good and I feel stuck. How long you should do that is another question. I think one of the, the guides that should, should be useful in determining that is to ask yourself, if there's an end state that I'm trying to approach, am I getting closer to it across time? You know, if I'm, I'm learning a new skill, is the delta between where I am and where I'd like to be shrinking over time? The, the gap between those two shrinking, or is it staying the same or is it even getting larger? And if it's staying the same or getting larger, then I'm probably not getting closer. And that's that's a good a good indication that I should probably quit. It's time to move on. I've thought a lot about this. And in my last book, I wrote a chapter about quitting. And I was trying to figure out why I, I appear to be quite a good quitter. Mm -hmm. I'm well known for quitting school, my first company, my second company, um, university after one lecture. And this is the quitting framework I tried to draw, draw up. Okay. So I'm going to just slide it across the, yeah, yeah. the desk and please ask me if you've got any questions and then okay. I'll... <laughs> so there's two kind of routes you can go down the quitting framework. Is it, are you thinking of quitting because it's hard? You're running a marathon, it's the last yeah. mile of the race. It's hard, but it's worth it. Yep. So if it's hard and it's not worth it, quit. Mm -hmm. If it's hard and it's worth it, stay the course. Um, going down the other side, it sucks. That could be a relationship, a place you're living, the job you have as an actuary, whatever. Yeah. Um, so so this, this framework seems to me unassailable. In other words... There's nothing, I can't imagine that anything here could be disagreed with because it makes total sense. And it's nice and broad. It's it's nice and broad, right? Yeah, you can imagine any situation being folded into it. I, the other thing I quite like about it is that uh, this distinction between it's just hard and it sucks is, is very central to a lot of the ideas in, in my book. And I think if something sucks, it's emotionally unrewarding and you hate it and you're grinding through it, most of the time you should quit. And, and you have here this one limb to your model that says, if you can make it suck less, continue on. Marriage Very counseling, often, yeah, speaking right. to your boss. Right, exactly. And so there's there's great value in asking that question. But uh, the, it's just hard part I'm focusing on because a huge part of this book is about how hardship is the first step in making something good. Yeah. Good stuff happens when things are hard. And because we're human and we have been evolutionarily, I don't know, penned into the situation where hardship is seen as a problem, like we're using too many resources, don't do something that's harder than it needs to be. We're very used to that. It's not true about everything we do, but it's true about enough things that we misinterpret hardship or hardness for being a problem. Whereas in many domains, the good stuff only happens almost every time after it gets hard. Mm. If you love the Diary of a CEO brand and you watch this channel, please do me a huge favor become part of the 15% of the viewers on this channel that have hit the subscribe button. It helps us tremendously and the bigger the channel gets, the bigger the guests.